Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. We are holding towards the end of chapter 24. Chapter 24 will come to the conclusion almost where 25, chapter 25, the rabbi will summarize everything we studied in the last six chapters. So just very briefly about what we covered so far, we have discovered that sin equal idol worship in the Kabbalah or spiritual terminology, because when we connect to God or believe in God in the Jewish way, there is only one, not first, not the only one king or only one ruler, but there's only one. We are all part of God. If we are separating ourselves from God, we are, so to say, moving God away from that area, and therefore it's considered idol, someone who is a counterpart to God. So in a spiritual sense, it doesn't matter what kind of a sin a person commits. A sin is separating completely from God. Therefore, the fact that there are different various punishments or different types of repentance required based on the sin, severe sins, lighter sins, does not affect the separation from God. And as the rabbi is going to continue on, this is where we stopped. And I showed with you an introduction. The action is the same in all sins. There is no difference. The effect after the action, what happens after the action varies from sin to sin. And I used an example. If a soldier was told while in training to point the gun forward or upwards and he refuses, that's one thing. Or if he's told to move ahead, run forward, and he refuses, he disobeyed the command of the commander in chief, of the officer in charge. There is a punishment for that. But if he does the same thing at, in battle while the war is taking place, the effect can be grave, very devastating, because it can cause the loss of life, the loss of battle, because when you need to charge forward and the soldiers said, well, I want to understand why, I want to make sure I have enough water to drink when I get there, I want to make sure I'm not going to get dirty in the mud. If he starts questioning instead of following the orders, he might stop the entire unit, which might cause the entire army to lose the battle, the war. The action in training and in real was the same, disobeying. The effect is what the consequence from disobeying varies. The same is with regards to sins. There are sins that the punishment is lashes. There are sins the punishment are warning. There are sins that the punishment is um, anger from God. There are no punishment. Positive commandments, disobeying God commandments in positive. There are no plushes. There is no punishment. All you have to do is ask forgiveness. There are punishments. That are, there are sins that require execution. There are different types of sins. However, it doesn't mean that one sin achieves uh, our distance from God more than the other they all have the same action. The consequence, the outcome will vary later on. And that's why the fact that one sin does not have a great punishment shouldn't be taken lightly. The rabbi also proved that from the point that I, and, and we went through, that's a Talmudic discussion last time we went through, I don't want to repeat it, just to remind you that uh, if someone is not well and he needs to violate, we need to violate Shabbat law for that person, we are violating the Shabbat law. Even though Shabbat law is one of the most uh, uh, strict 
commandments, yet Shabbat says, push me away. However, when it comes to other sin, idolatry or adultery, we don't push away the law and we say even at the cost of life. On the other hand, someone who disobeys Shabbat, he does not keep Shabbat, is not reliable for slaughtering. Yet, someone who is worshiping idols and is trained to slaughter animals properly and is, is, is trustworthy, we are able to eat from the animals he slaughtered because we trust him. In other words, it's not about how far we go from God by the punishment, as we see the different ways we look at someone who slaughters animals versus keeping Shabbat and idolatry, etc. Therefore, the Rebbe is saying that it's all about the effect that this cutoff, that when we separate ourselves from God, will have afterwards. But the actual separation from God, idol activity, creating an idol, is achieved even when it comes to a rabbinic edict. If the rabbi said, wait six hours between dairy and meat, or the rabbi said the separation between dairy and meat is not just for beef, but also for chickens, and someone might say, well, it's only rabbis. God gave them the power to enact, and they know what they are doing. They didn't just come up with some kind of ideas because they had nothing else to do. And therefore, when someone disobey God in any of the rabbinic enactments, they are, they are separating themselves from God, just like any other sin. We are on page 333. And I think I shared with you the story of the Magid of Kuznets about a man who wanted someone to sell him his mansion. He had a three-story building. The man said, no way. I spent so many years planning and, and working on it. Finally, he says, will you list it for me? He said, no way. Then he says to him, how about give me permission to hang a, a nail in that, in that mansion? He said, sure, no problem. And then he started banging, uh, knocking on the door. He came in because he has a nail hanging on the wall. He wants to hang his coat and he's coming in. And now then the guy says, to him, I'll give you a separate entrance. I'll give you a room to hang it. Then he gave him the room. Then he brought in his family. He gave him the floor. Then finally, the rich man moved out. He had no choice. This is the way the evil inclination works. In fact, <laughs> the Hasidic uh, interpretation to the scheme of the evil is, and it's based on Torah text, that the evil does not tell the person disobey God. He never tells us, ah, you don't have to keep caution. It doesn't tell someone who's raised with that tradition, of course. It doesn't say to us, ah, Shabbat, well, as someone told me in this community, we had some ingenious humans one of them says, I keep Shabbat till Shabbat afternoon. Oh. So <laughs> it's true. It, this is. But he started start Shabbat probably. No, he says, I'm Shomer Shabbat till Shabbat afternoon. Then another time he says, he keeps Shabbat, he's Shomer Shabbat, but not Yom Tov. You know, it's uh, pick and choose. It's to me, it's so uh, whatever. I should not, I'm not judging the persons because if I were. Is he making progress? If, is he making progress? Actually, it's regression. Yeah, but anyway, I'm not going to go off that. I I can't judge people because I was raised differently. But uh, it's it's very it's 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 very difficult to to understand to fathom that someone will tell you I'm Shomer Shabbos only till Shabbos afternoon. You know, it's it's he's Shomer Shabbos meaning accepting God's rules and at the same time he's passing judgment telling god what the rules are but it, it's like telling the judge you know i i respect you as long as you rule the way you know i tell it but the idea that i wanted to share <laughs> is that the evil inclination the talmud tells us that the evil is very sly just like i told you with the nail there is another way of looking at it he says to a person, Hayom omerlo Today, he tells him, do this. Tomorrow, he tells him, do that. And slowly but surely, he makes him do less and less. 
the Hasidic interpretation to that is, he never tells you don't do. He never tells you don't keep Shabbat, don't keep Passover, don't keep kosher. Quite the opposite. He says, keep kosher, keep Shabbat, but don't be so excited. Don't be so happy. You don't have to do extra. You, you, you spend a lot of money to celebrate Shabbat. What if you skip one salad or one dish, you know? That's what it means. He tells you, do this, do that. In other words, he interfere with your action, not to put a roadblock and stop you from doing, but instead do it the way he likes it. So he makes you do it, but not the way God wants you to do it, but the way he wants you to do it. Slow down, cool it. Next Shabbat, cool it a little more. And the, a month later, a little more. Now, once he got you trapped in his net, you look back a year later, if you, for a year from now, you look back, you'll see it was uh, down the drain, uh, down down slope, where you, a person ends up not keep, even keeping Shabbat. Huh? Degression. Degression, right. It's kind of like a mitzvah. Degression. That's what brings another mitzvah during an avera, another... Right, but the co the point I'm making, he does not tell a person to do an Avera, to do a sin. He tells him, do a mitzvah. That's the, in other words, when the Talmud tells us that this is, the, the Talmud tells us, this is the path of the evil. Today tells you do this, tomorrow it tells you do that. That's, and then he makes you go and sin. That's the Talmud text. The, Rabbi, the Kabbalistic interpretation is, he doesn't tell you do this, meaning sin. Do that, do another sin. As you say, one sin lead to the other. He tells you to do a mitzvah. But he tells you to do a mitzvah the way he likes it. In other words, don't spend so much money. Don't spend so much time. Don't have so much excitement. Don't look for the exciting part. Just do it because God said so. Next time, he makes you do it a little less. In other words, he's not trying to stop you from doing the mitzvah. He's trying to make you do the mitzvah the way he likes you to do it. And then step one step at a time, it gets to a point where you ask yourself, how did it come to the point that I don't even care to do the mitzvah? It all started from that point. I share that with my children on many occasions, that the beginning, you, once you are in mid slope, once you start sliding, there is no way of stopping. The idea is not to get to that point. That's the idea of fences. Who talked about the fence? On Shabbat, we had this discussion. The, that's the idea of the fence that the rabbis made. People think, oh, the rabbi is too strict. The rabbis tried to make it harder on us, but it's not true. The rabbis knew that without a fence, we are guaranteed to be down in the valley because the evil is joining you. And he says, come on, let's do it. Do the mitzvah, celebrate Shabbat, celebrate Passover, celebrate, eat kosher, but don't, don't be so excited. And he makes you do the mitzvah just the way he likes you to do it. And slowly but truly infuses you with more coldness and negativity until the point come which we say there is no sense of doing the mitzvah anymore. And that's when there is no way of, go it's very difficult to go back. Now the rabbi is going to go again. So these are the points that the rabbi is going to make towards the end of, until the end of the chapter. And then I'll go back and summarize it. Page 333. In the following note, part of Tanya is the text. And later on, the rabbi added some notes. The notes are in smaller text and are grayed. And they adding some some understanding to some of the text. In the following note, the Alter Rebbe states that the varying degree of severity in the punishments imposed for various sins correspond to the blemish caused by each sin. The purpose of punishment is not the punishment per se, but purification of the soul from the blemish which the sin brought about. Thus, the greater the blemish, the more severe the punishment. What the rabbi wants to teach us, as we're going to read in a moment, punishment is not as, an, as a direct result of our doing, of our damage. Punishment is the fixing of the damage. So the bigger the damage, the bigger the, the, the harsher the, the, the fixing. And I think I shared um, an example I like to use because 
was effective for me. When you as a mother or a father tell a child that they need to take to get a shot, a tetanus shot, they are screaming and yelling and they blame their mother to be abusive. And in today's world, they can call the, the HRS and the state and say, my parents are abusing me. And the parents will be in, a, in big trouble. We have to, it's a whole different universe today. What happens when before the child goes to play and his mother says, wear sandals, wear shoes. Because if you walk barefoot, you may step on a nail, as I it's happened to me as a child, on a rusty nail, and you'll get infected and you'll need to get a shot. Now, the child, if he refuses to wear shoes, who caused this trouble? His behavior. He should have listened to his parents. The fact that he's getting a shot, is this a punishment? Or it is to help him recover for his misbehaving. So children, from a child's point of view, oh, you're punishing me. You told me to wear shoes. I didn't listen to you. Now you get, you want to punish me for it. I don't want to get punished. They don't want to have the shot. But as adults, we look back at it and say, thank God there is such a thing called a shot. Because with the shot, you can get cured and repair and remove the damage you created. So the shot is not part of the problem. The shot is part of the solution. We, a children, look at it as part of the problem. So if someone's seen and he gets, the punishment is a severe punishment. We look at it as if this is, God is angry at me. God wants to warn me not to do it again, but it's not true. The purpose of the punishment is to cleanse the person, to bring him back. So some scenes, the action will cause a major damage to the soul. Some will cause a minor damage. You want to remove the damage, that's when punishment comes in. It's not about revenge. It's not about reprimanding. It's not about, you see, you didn't listen. That's what happens. There's nothing to do. And I, I think I, I shared on many occasions that the idea of hell or purgatory, as we'll discuss soon, is by choice. No one is forced to go into purgatory in Judaism. Aside the fact that it's only temporary, it's only for purifying the soul, cleansing the garments, which we're not going to talk in details. We're going to get to it in Tanya much later. And therefore, the purpose of purgatory is given to a person. You want to purify yourself? You want to clean all the stain that you created during your lifetime? Or you may choose to enter the ballroom to the to the big party, the gala, with the torn clothes and, and stains. That, that's your choice. In other words, not God's taking revenge or that God wants to hurt us. What the opposite? God created a choice for us to be able to repair the damage we created. Just like there is a shot that hurts and a child don't see it as part of the solution. You see it as part of a problem as if the parents are taking revenge or trying to punish him for not listening. However, again, back to our discussion, the act of a sin will separate us from God completely, equally does not matter what type of punishment is involved. Says the Rebbe, corresponding to the extent and specific nature of the blemish caused by the sin in the soul and in its source, in the supernal, in the supernal worlds, are the various purifying processes and punishments in purgatory or in this world. That is the suffering of the soul in purgatory or one suffering in this world whose purpose is to purify the soul. Some people are lucky enough where God will cause them to suffer in this universe to repair and cleanse and purify their soul rather than doing it up in heaven when the soul suffers. Says, tell us the Mishnah that one hour of pain and suffering in the world to come equals or is far greater than the entire life full of pain and suffering. In other words, imagine the most difficult, painful experience a person can go through their lifetime, the entire lifetime. It's not as painful as one hour in purgatory. However, one hour of good deeds 
and study of Torah like we do now is equal and greater than all of the world to come because there they cannot con connect to God as we are, as we will feel it when we go up to heaven. So back to our discussion, punishment, purgatory is not a revenge. It's not hurting you measure for measure. It is the ability to repair, to cleanse, to purify. And therefore the deeper the damage, the stain, the greater the, the purifying process. Some, as I said, weak, righteous men are lucky enough that God will exact punishment, meaning will purify their soul here on earth. So when they ascend up in heaven, that's the only way to explain why righteous men suffer. That's why all our foremothers were barren. They couldn't have children because God wanted them to purify everything that they could on this earth. So Sarah couldn't have children. Rebecca couldn't have children. Rachel couldn't have children. This is the only reason we can explain that the Torah, actually it's a medrash that medrash explained. That's why Abraham was tested. His wife was taken. Abraham was tested. His nephew was uh, taken captive. Abraham was tested with famine. Yitzhak was taste, tested. His wife was taken away. Uh, his son was misbehaving. Every one of our forefathers had great tests, very painful tests. Even Moshe, Moses was tested on many, many occasions. One can ask God, if you love them, make their life easy, you know, make their life uh, comfortable. The answer is, if there was anything they needed to purify, this was the process of purification. So when they ascend up to heaven, it's all cleaned and there is nothing else done. Sure. I don't hear what? Would you come back in no, you're asking if the reincarnation is part of the purification process. Is that the question? The answer is no, because you are mixing, it's easy to mix up, but you are mixing two separate issues. One is the mission, and the other is the damage created to our garments. We have a mission. The mission is to fulfill 613 commandments. Reincarnation is when a person did not fulfill the 613 commandments. So they come back for few. <clears throat> Purification is the damage, stain, garments. Thought, speech, and action are the garments of the soul. Imagine my shirt as a stain. Some stains you just... Do like that. Some of it you need water, hot water, soap, detergent. Some of it you need um, chlorine. What do you call it? Uh, bleach. bleach. And some of the garments have a hole through, piercing through, that needs to mend, needs to fix. These are the garments. This is the process of purification. No one comes back for this. Okay. They're, they're, they're the negative. Right? Just a minute. So we are lucky that God gave us the the option to repair, to fix. There is a tailor, there is a dry cleaners up in heaven. He says you can put it in. It's a process that's very painful, or we can ask for it to be done here. There is a famous story. It's in the Talmud of Rabbi Hanina ben Tra Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa. Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa was a very poor man so poor that one time his daughter asked for his father, her father, she says, I need a candle to light for Shabbat. It's a mitzvah. So she didn't, didn't mind uh, living in the darkness. She didn't mind living in cold, but she had a Shabbat with candle. So he said to her, look around the pantry, tell me what's left. She says, there is no oil. You, those days they, they used oil except uh, we said any other liquid she said yeah there is vinegar he said so pour vinegar to the candle to the candelabra and he who caused oil to ignite will let vinegar light and she lit and the vinegar acted like oil so he was known to be of great great miracles one day his wife came complaining that Enough, enough is enough. They can't live in poor in poverty. She she didn't buy a new outfit already for 12 years. 
even the one she got from Salvation Army already need fixing. She she's unable to anymore. So he said to her, you know, I'm obligated to support you. It's part of the Ketuba. You're supposed to provide our clothing and food. So he turned to me and says, God, please, give Hanina and his wife. That's what it says. Give your servant Hanina and his wife money to pay for the needs. And suddenly a, a, a long leg, leg of a table for, of pure gold fell down, came down into the house. That was enough to buy stocks of apple for the next 20 years to make just for the dividends. And she <laughs> was very excited. She was so happy that she went to bed early. When she was sleeping at night, she had a dream that she is in heaven. And all her colleagues and friends are sitting around tables at a banquet. Everybody has a table of three legs, except they have a table of two legs. Ali, you heard the story? No? Because the tables in heaven are three legs, made out of three legs, not four. Uh, everything is three in holiness. The foundations of the world is three. God, the Jewish people are made out of three. God gave us the Torah on the third month. On the, third month. the Torah is divided into three, uh, five books of Moses, writings and prophets. Everything is three. The Jewish people, as I said, are made out of Kohen, Levi, and Isa. Everything is three. So the, leg, the tables were made out of three legs, but their table had only two legs. What happened to the third leg? They already used it in this world. So she was very embarrassed. She had to hold the table. She woke up, she turned to her husband, and she says, get it out. <laughs> Take it back. I don't want it. So he turned, he says, God, he went outside. He says, God, your servant listen, obeys his, his wife's uh, order. He don't want the leg anymore. I, we, we want you to get it back. And he took it and he threw it as far as he can. And a hand, that's the Talmud, a hand stretched out from the heavens, from the sky, and grabbed it. The rabbis concluded that the miracle of God accepting back that leg is a much greater miracle than providing, because God provides. And it happens many times in every generation. There are miracles God gives. I am a walking miracle that God provides. Everybody, I think, has stories that God provides. But for God to take back, it does not happen. It's very rare. He was such a holy man that God accepted and was willing to take it back. In other words, he already made a deal with God. And everybody was happy. All parties were happy. And yet God said, he said to God, I'm sorry. I go. I take back my word. I want it back. And God accepted it. So the idea from that lesson was, there, there are many there are many lessons. I just want to talk about one lesson that you know, they suffered greatly. They couldn't make ends meet, meaning they went to sleep hungry many times. They were starving. She couldn't buy an outfit. She was known to be very poor. In fact, there are many stories about the the, the that to to fake it for the the neighbors she would uh, put uh, uh, wood in the oven to make it as if it's baking challah, but there was no challah there. One time a neighbor was nosy and she jumped into the oven from shame. There, there, is, there, there are many, many stories about Rabbi Hanina Mendoza. Rabbi Hanina Mendoza was the mo greatest miracle man in his generation. Yet, he was the first man and it affected his family. It was really causing a lot of pain suffering. The story of that leg comes to show us that what we have here, sometimes it's part of the purification. So up in heaven, we have a clean slate. We have purified ourselves, we have cleansed ourselves so that God is able to give us all that is positive and good. And by the way, this is not Kabbalah, this is part of the uh, Talmud. The, Nobody heard that before? You No? No? You did not? Okay. I'm no. sorry. Ali, you did not hear about that? That's the story. But the idea that here on earth... But if it's purified, it's all there, yeah. Okay. That's the... That's... Yes.
for each transgression and sin, its appropriate punishment. For the purpose of cleansing and removing the stain and the blemish caused by that specific sin. Similarly, the blemish caused by the sins carrying by penalty of death at the hands of heaven or correct varies from sin one sin to the other. To return to our original point, we are right past the note. After the sinful act, in the case of those sins which do not carry the punishment of karet and death of, by the hands of heaven, I think I shared with you last time we talked about it. I'm not going to go over again. Karet means to be cut off. Cut off at the age of no more than 50. Death in the punishment of death by the hands of heaven is no more than 60 years of age. These are the types of punishment. Sometimes God says he will not leave, meaning God cuts the cable of energy and the person will live either up to 50 or up to 60. The sinner's animal soul, which animates the body and is clothed in it, as well as its, its body itself, return and rise from the Sitra, Achra, and Klippa, where to they descended when the sin was committed, and they draw closer to the holiness of the divine soul that pervades them. The divine soul always believes in the one God and remains faithful to him, even while the sin is being committed. For it is only the animal soul via the body that performs the sinful act. What the rabbi, the point the rabbi is making now is that no matter how far we go away from God, it is temporary. There is no way to completely separate ourselves from God. It's impossible. So when a person sins, when a person curses away, he don't want anything to do with God. It is only temporary. One day they wake up and they say, we misbehave, we want to go back. They do not have to trailblaze a new path to God. All they have to do is remove all the barriers they created and they find themselves with God. Because the connection to God is permanent. The discord, the, 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 the separation from God is temporary. So it, it's a double-edged sword. On one hand, reconnecting to God is very easy. It's just refraining from offending God, and then we're back into God. On the other hand, when we sin, we take God with us as well, and it is the greatest and the gravest behavior any creature can achieve against God. Remember last time, well, a few weeks ago, we spoke about the mosquito, the fly, that is farther from God, and a man, when they sin, they are farther from God because they have a choice. Therefore, when I have a choice and I make the wrong choice, what I have done, I have not separated from God, but I've grabbed God with me and I load God into the lowest possible place, an embarrassment place for God to be. Uh, so on, on one hand, as I said, we are always connected to God. So reconnect with God is easy just to stop sinning and then we're reconnected. On the other hand, whenever we sin, we actually take God to a place where he don't want to be. And this is the rabbi who wants to continue. But at that time, the divine soul was in a state of very, very veritable exile in the animal soul, which derives from the sitra achra from the other side, which causes the, causes the body to sin and drags it down with itself to the lowest depths. So low, in fact, that it is even lower than the impurity of the Sitra Acha and the Klippa of idolatry. May God preserve, that, preserve us. What the rabbi says is take the worst <laughs> defiled shell that can be existing. Uh, the shell of Esau, the shell of Ishmael, the shell of the most defiled part of the uh, human being or a, a creature that can ever existed. When a human being, a Jewish person, sin, they grab God and drag him down even farther than that to a place that I, and no one can reach that low, that the depth of that filth or defilement or darkness, nobody else can. Because 
the Sitra Akha, the other side, is assigned a mission to test us, is assigned a mission to try and convince us to go there. Therefore, they are not dragging God to a defiled place, to a dark and muddy place. When an animal does something that's very inappropriate, it's part of the nature they are creating. By a human, when they are making a choice, they are actually creating another idol and at the same time grabbing God into the other guy, idol. And therefore, the, the depth of that defilement is something that no one else, no creature, no angel, no animal, no other human can ever reach as much as, 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 as low, as far as a man when they sing. All that the rabbi is trying to say, not to put us down, but to explain that when we face a test, we should be able to think about it and it should hold us back. An exile's foreign surroundings restrict him from expressing his abilities and ideas. Similarly, the divine soul, which is in exile within the animal soul when he once sins, is unable to express itself in mastery of the body and in harnessing it for the service of God by reason of the foreign environment of the klipa. There is no greater exile than this exile of the divine soul within the animal soul that is brought on through sin. It is a plunge from a lofty roof to a deep pit. As for, as explained earlier, the source and root of all Jewish souls is in the divine wisdom and God and his wisdom are one and the same. In other words, when you talk about the godly soul, it's God, it's part of God. And sin plunges the soul from this very lofty plane to the depth of exile within the Sitracha. It is comparable to one who seizes the king's head, drags it down and dips his face in a privy full of filth, the ultimate in humiliation. Even if he does it only for a moment, the rabbi is saying, imagine someone goes into the king's chamber, the closest he can get to the king. In the kingdom, there is no more important uh, place than the king's chamber and the king is sitting on his throne wearing a crown and he grabs the kings and he drags them into the toilet and he pushes his head in, down the toilet with the filth that is in the toilet seat this is what is done to the soul which is God when a man sinned because godly soul is an expression of God it's part of God and when a man sin, he allows the animal soul to grab hold of the godly soul and take it down to the filth, the filthiest place that can be found. Animals are unable to get that close. No one else can get to that to that low level. Only a human being. So on one hand, because the godly soul was never separated from God, when a man ceases from sin and returns back to God, is reconnected. Immediately, there is no process by which he needs to reattach himself or herself to God. On the other hand, at the same time, during the time the person sin, they are dragging the king's head and shoving it into the toilet. For the clipot, even if it's done temporarily, in other words, if someone does it to the king and says, I didn't do it permanently, I just did it for 10 seconds. What's the big deal? There's no such thing. Because even temporarily, it, it affects, it embarrasses the shame for the king is immeasurable. For the klipot and sitra achra are called vomit and filthy and filth as is known. Similarly, when one seizes a divine soul, which stems from the divine wisdom, the king's head, and throw and through his sin forces it into the klipa, a, a privy full of filth. He brings upon his soul the most unspeakable humiliation. 
even if he does so only for a moment, for afterwards, the soul rises out of its exile. He can return back to God immediately. We thus see that the differences between the various sins apply only after the sin has been committed. During the act, however, every sin tears one away from God, since every Jew is endowed with a hidden love of God, by virtue of which he wishes to be constantly united with him and never to be separated from him. Not even for a moment he can employ this hidden love in fulfilling all the mitzvot and in avoiding every sin, as the Alter Rebbe concludes in the following chapter. So what we summarize, let's just summarize what we just studied. First, sin equal idol. Two, sin is total separation from God. Number three, the only cause of someone's sin is a spirit of folly. That's why a sota, a woman who is hiding from her husband with another man, is called sota because there is no common sense that can, sense that can explain why she did it, other than the spirit of folly entered her to make her act in stupidity. It is a symbol and example for all sin. When a man contemplate the idea of sin, they realize it makes no sense. The only way people can justify it is because they had no control. Their mind was asleep. They could not realize what they are doing at the time of sin. We also discussed why is it idle? Why is it so, so far from God? It doesn't matter the type of sin. We discussed that there are three types of separation from God. You have animals, you have the fly, the mosquito, where he ex does not excrete, it only takes, grabs, which is farther than all animals. We call all animals give and take. That's the way God created the universe. It's a two-way street. You, get, you take and you give back. Uh, and a fly will only take. That's a farther away from God. A man that sin is even farther than that. Therefore, we are told that man was, called, was created last in the creation to remind them, if you look at the human body, we are even worse than any, the worst type of creature that was created before. If you look at the soul, as I told you a story that I explained, if you look at the soul, we were created first. But if you look at the body, the body was created last because the body is the one that can drag a person farther from God then even the worst animal that does not take, that only take it does not give back. That's why when Reuven wants to save his brother Yosef, he is willing to throw him into the pit that is loaded yes. with snakes and scorpions. How can the Torah testify that he wanted to save his life? And the answer was they have no choice. They were created by God and they will not cause any harm to anyone unless God instructed them to do. Humans, are on the other hand, have you free choice. They are godlike, And therefore they can make the wrong behavior. They can act wrongly. So when they want to murder Yosef, he says, please, let's throw him to the pit and let's the animal, let the animal take care of him. As we know, God protected him. And that's why the rabbi said, when God created the, the animals, he gave them one commandment, and that is respect and fear the human. How come animals will attack humans? Because humans, unfortunately, do not look to them as human beings, but another creature and threatening. And if they are territorial, oh, he's taking in, he's coming into my territory, and they'll fight back. There are countless stories of rabbis, holy men, who had the godly image on their faces around their body that had no fear and never got hurt by a creature, even though they are animals that are known to devour humans. The only reason they do it is not because they disobey God, it's because they follow God's commandment. However, the humans that they see, they meet sometimes don't, don't look like human beings. The rabbi continues on to explain that the dogs don't look at the punishment to measure the type of a sin, how bad the sin is, 
because a sin, the action is all the same in training or in actual war time. It's all the same. The consequences are different. And therefore to repair the consequences, sometimes it's much, much harder, but the act is the same, rebellious against God. And therefore we're creating another idol. The rabbi explained, therefore, that the, rebel the, the, the fixing is not a punishment, but actual an ability to correct, to mend, to remove the stain and the damage caused. And the, finally, the rabbi is talking about the fact that we are unable to be separated from God, not for, a, for an iota of second. So it's a double-edged sword. On one hand, as soon as we desire to return back to God, we don't have to go through a stepping a steps to reapply for connecting to God as soon as we do what God wants. So if this morning I spoke gossip, if this morning I ate non-kosher, I need to repair because the damage it caused to my soul. But if I want to connect to God and I study Torah or I pray to God or I I help someone or I celebrate a holiday, I'm connecting to God automatically. We are with God all the time. On the other hand, realize, we need to realize what have the, the effect of a sin. When a person sin, they are not just causing themselves damage, but they are dragging God into the place of filth where it's inconceivable for a king to experience and definitely nobody else is able to get to that such low level other than the human being. That's why it's considered like idol worship. That next chapter, this concludes our uh, lesson tonight. For We concluded chapter 24. Next week, God willing, we're going to continue in chapter 25. Chapter 25, the rabbi will summarize everything we study and bring back full circle the, to the introduction. By the way, after 25, chapter 26 and on, we'll talk about joy. To serve God with joy is a prerequisite. And for the next six or eight chapters, the rabbi is from 26 to 34, I believe. So it's eight chapters. The rabbi is going to concentrate how do we have joy, no matter what difficulties. And I encourage you to invite people because from now, after uh, this is one more chapter that to summarize, chapter 26, it's all about joy. It is something that is so necessary in our day to day life. Just back, back to 25. In the introduction, the rabbi was talking about it is near to you, Moshe tells the Jewish people. It's not, of course, the sea. It's not up, up in the heavens. It's near to you to do, to speak, and to think about serving God. Now, the rabbi will summarize from eighteen, from 14 to 18, which was the short, the long way, from 18 to 24, which is the long way, and we'll put it together. How is it possible for us to refrain from sin? Just thinking about not allowing our, our evil soul to make us act in a foolish way, but rather to stop for a moment and think of the consequences. And hopefully it will st stop us from sin. And after that, uh, chapter 26 on, is another trick of the evil, which is melancholy, depression, to be down, laziness is the key uh, trick for the animal soul. And therefore to fight it, we need to serve God with joy. We need to live a happy life. That will come up in chapter 26. So we'll conclude right here and meet again next week. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye. Yashikoach, Rabbi, thank you. Thank you, thank you. What?